The National Groundwater Association and the Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers present the 1993 Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecture, The Fate of Organic Compounds and Geochemical Processes in Contaminated Aquifers. The Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers selects an internationally recognized scientist or engineer to lecture to students, faculty, and groundwater professionals to foster an interest in groundwater hydrology. The 1993 Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecture is presented by Dr. Mary Jo Baedecker. Dr. Baedecker received a PhD in geochemistry from the George Washington University and is currently a research chemist with the United States Geological Survey in Reston, Virginia. Her work focuses on environmental chemistry, primarily organic and inorganic geochemistry of contaminated aquifers. This uh, talk that is part of the U.S. Geological Survey Toxic Substances Hydrology Program, and we have both surface water and groundwater sites that we are looking at. These in blue here are surface water sites, whereas these red areas are groundwater sites. So we are studying crude oil, crude oil, creosote, hydrocarbons, uh, and gasoline, and sewage plume, uh, fractured rock sites. And in the middle, in this yellow area, is the mid-continent area where we're just studying non-point source pollution, such as agricultural chemicals. Now, the two sites that I'm going to talk about today are the in north central Minnesota, the crude oil spill site of Bemidji, Minnesota, and a site here in, in uh, a hydrocarbon uh, spill site where gasoline was con is contaminated part of an aquifer in the Lenny Coastal Plain, called the Galloway site. The purpose of this study was to investigate the transport and degradation of hydrocarbons in groundwater to determine the important geochemical processes associated with hydrocarbon degradation, to investigate the evolution of a contaminant plume, and finally to describe these geochemical processes quantitatively. In today's talk, I will be talking about mainly the first three of these. First, I would like to acknowledge several people because this is an interdisciplinary study and there were a number of people that were involved in the collection and interpretation of the data. Most of the work presented is that of me and Isabel Casarelli, but also Curtis Finney and Jessica Hoppel who has helped with analytical and field work. Uh, John Evans with SEM work. Mark Hull from the USGS District Office in Minnesota. I helped with the hydrogeology and the unsaturated zone processing. Uh, Beacon House was the first organic work at the site, Phil Bennett, some of the inorganic work at the site, and Art Baer and Jeff Fisher with the USGS New Jersey District Office, who've done a lot of work in the unsaturated zone and hydrogeology. No one in this room yet really needs to see this slide, but, but I have it in for, for people who aren't so familiar with contaminant hydrogeology, where you have uh, something like oil, which is floating here on the water table, and a plume develops down gradient. And a number of processes um, develop, such as sorption, um, microbial activity, degassing when gas pressures build up, mineral alteration because everything affects the organic processes also affects the inorganic processes. And of course, you have a lot around this contaminant plume, you have what I'm calling a mixing front, which is where you have the contaminated water mixing with uncontaminated water. You have a lot of interesting geochemical processes that occur there. The first site, as I said, I wanted to talk about is, is, is called the Bemidji site, which is in Minnesota in glacial outwash material. And this is where a buried pipeline uh, burst and oil was spilled uh, over land surface. And this is where it was sprayed over land surface. You can see the vegetation here has been destroyed. And the oil has accumulated in topographic flows, and that's the reason it flowed along this path here. And there were two oil bodies then that now reside on the water table, at least two, there may be other small ones, but there's two major, one is here and one is here. This one is where they did trenching in order to collect as much of the oil as possible to remove it. There were about 10,500 barrels of crude that were spilled, and after as much could be removed as possible, about 2,500 remained. Now, it was lucky for us that the direction of the overland spray was in this direction because the direction of the groundwater flow was in this direction, which means that what we're seeing in the groundwater is actually due to the oil which is floating on the water table and it's not due to this overland uh, spray zone here. 
This is a, a field uh, picture downgraded. This is the pipeline would be back here. This is the downgraded area. And this is just taking some of, uh, some of our field here where we're collecting water samples. This is a map of the site. And here's where the buried pipeline was. And this is the oil spray area that I showed you. And this is the direction of groundwater flow. The red points here are sampling points. Some of these are at several levels. The water table here is 6 to 10 meters below land surface. And the average linear flow velocity is 0.1 to 0.25 meters per day, but it varies as much as 0.05 to 0.5 meters per day. I'm going to show a cross section a little bit later, which will go here from point A through the oil spray area to point A prime here. This is the type of uh, material that we encountered, and, and you can see the nature of it. This is a well-sorted medium sand and would be considered homogeneous in any regional aquifer study. But at this site, at the small scale, the geochemical processes that are occurring, it's really fairly heterogeneous. heterogeneous. You can see that there's silty layers here and coarser layers here. It's mostly uh, quartz sand with about 30% feldspars, 5% carbonates, less than 5% clay minerals about 0.2 or less percent organic carbon. This is the cross-section that I said from A to A prime here. And we looked at the geochemistry of, of the groundwater and, and divided it into eight zones based on the total organic carbon, the total inorganic carbon, the amount of iron and manganese, and the pH of the water. And you can see that this, this, their zones are quite different chemically. This zone is immediately uh, beneath the, the, where oil was sprayed on land surface. And it has uh, no volatile hydrocarbons that are the major component, the major soluble component of the crude oil, such as benzene, the alpha benzene. These are not present in this water. But it has very high calcium and PCO2, which is due to the dissolution of carbonates. And I think the reaction is that the oil on land surface, some of it is gradually washed through the unsaturated zone where it's degraded, which increases the CO2, which increases dissolution of carbonates. This water immediately around this oil body is the anoxic zone, and it's very high in iron, manganese, and methane concentrations, as well as organic and inorganic carbon. And this zone is the intermediate zone where the concentrations of oxygen vary considerably uh, from 0.1, uh, in some cases there are even some anoxic pockets, to about uh, 1 milligram per liter. The background concentrations here are about 8 milligram per liter. This zone 5 is contaminated in that there are, there are things present that are only present because of the presence of the oil, but yet the benzene, alkyl benzenes, are below drinking uh, concentrations or below drinking water standards, so it would not be considered, uh, it would be considered potable, but we can see evidence that it is contaminated. The next slide shows the actual composition of the oil body. This is not my work. This is work with Adep A. Sayad and Bill Kokorath from the USGS in Menlo Park. They set out to do a model of the movement of the oil body itself. The oil body has moved about 30 meters uh, during the, during, uh, from, from the time it was spilled, which is about 7, 1979. And they developed a special sampling device whereby you could take a core and actually freeze the bottom of the core uh, using liquid CO2 under pressure and uh, bring the core intact to land surface. Then it was sectioned, and each of these uh, sections then was, uh, was analyzed for the amount of water, sediment, and oil. And from that, they drew this map, which is the map of the fraction, total fraction of oil. And this would represent one section then, which would have been divided, subdivided into 10 or 12 subsections. So there was a lot of data that went into this, this slide. You can see that the oil ends, it's not a discrete oil body as we show it in most of our pictures, but these yellow areas are where the concentration of oil is 50% or greater as a, as a total fraction of the oil sediment in the water. Also, this black area, these black lines here, show the amount of oil that was accumulated in wells. And you can see that the amount of oil that is detected in the wells does not correlate at all well with where the major oil pools are. So just finding oil in wells may not be a major, major uh, place where you find oil in subsurface. The next few slides, I want to show you the uh, extent of migration of this plume over time. And the first slide here is for volatile organic carbon. This is mainly benzene and alkyl benzene, which I said are the most soluble components. 
These are the concentrations in milligram per liter from 87 to 92. And you can see that the concentrations have not changed as much as one might expect uh, with, with flow velocity instead of about 0.1 meter per day. And you can, in fact, the zone of highest concentration actually seems to be uh, retained here closer to the source. But you do see there has been some movement and a little bit of plunging, perhaps, and, and uh, a pressure zone near the middle as the water is advected around this uh, oil body. Now, the composition of this fall for organic carbon is shown in this next slide. And this is the, this is the concentrations here in milligram per liter of the volatile components. And at the edge of the oil body in red, and 30 meters down gradient in blue, you can see the alkyl bent, the alkanes, the cycloalkanes that are cyclic, are not transported very far down the gradient, mainly because alkanes and cycloalkanes are not that soluble in water, also they are degraded. But you can see this tremendous uh, drop here in the in the uh, benzene and the alkyl benzenes, all of which are soluble. Uh, and you can see that this is a total of 41 compounds here. This is benzene toluene in the three xylene. See if you see three benzenes where you have three carbon groups attached to a benzene ring, and here you have four carbon groups attached to a benzene ring. You can see that the, the main component here is benzene, and, and they're pretty close to half of it is not it's like 30 meters down gradient. You can see that all the toluene is locked, and certain amounts of these others are selectively locked. Uh, one of the interesting things here uh, that Bob Eakenhouse found was that the 1, 2, 3, 4 tetramethylbenzene migrates much differently than 1, 2, 3, 5 tetramethylbenzene, which is almost surely due to biodegradation of, of the uh, selective biodegradation of these uh, compounds. And that led us to think that biodegradation is a very important process uh, in attenuating these hydrocarbons. Looking back to how the plume has changed with time, again, this is dissolved oxygen, showing here the anoxic plume and how little it's changed with time. Again, you see this freshening zone here as water, pressure water is moving under the under the plume. But it really, the anoxic plume has not migrated very far down gradient. Uh, as I pointed out before, the oxygen concentrations here are very variable in the sun. And again, the, the ferrous iron probably shows the, the most change with time. And the ferrous iron here has, you can see that the zone of high concentration here, 10 milligrams per liter, has migrated down gradient. And yet the extent of this, the, the iron zone really has not changed, which correlates well with the anoxic zone, that it hasn't changed very much moving down gradient. So, so that the iron, which is mobilized here, once it reaches here, it is precipitated out rather rapidly. Now, the next few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about the evolution of the plume uh, with time. I'm going to show some data first for right here at sampling point at the down gradient edge uh, of this oil body. And this is data, and this is in millimolar concentrations logarithmic over many scales. And this is from 1984 up, up to the present. And uh, it shows how the concentrations have changed with time at that one sampling location. And early on, you can see the major constituent was manganese, and its concentration has increased and then decreased. And then later we saw iron in solution, and then finally methane in solution. And this is uh, what you would predict on the basis of thermodynamics, that you would expect uh, manganese to go into solution before iron, which would go into solution before methanogenesis. Um, this is because of the energy that the organisms receive, and that the methanogenesis is the least efficient uh, reaction, so it should occur after the others. You can also see that there's a big fractionation of the carbon isotopes. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but you can see that the concentrations here have changed from something like minus 24, and we have values as high as plus 5 now, again, at this one sampling location. And this is due to the formation of methane, which fractionates isotopes. The concentrations of both methane and iron seem to have leveled off pretty close to one millimole, but are beginning to drop with time. We have several seasons of data, including 93 data, that shows they are slightly uh, dropping with time. I'm going to show a set of data uh, for some well uh, moving right along this flow path here, down gradient from the oil body. Uh, the first is uh, what happens to the volatile organic carbon concentration. And this is a 41 meter section along that flow path. You can see the volatile, uh, so the volatile organic carbon concentration here drops back to background concentrations at about uh, 41 meters. And uh, 
we would have expected this plume to have moved more like 500 to 1,300 meters since 1979. Um, there is, was no conserved reef solute that was present. And so I applied calcium, which is not conserved, because it is dissolving going in solution in parts of, parts of the, the, the slow path. But yet it, it shows that it still is way above background concentration at the same level that the bulbs were getting carbon concentrations down back to background levels. This is the background concentration of the county. We also did a one-dimensional model for the conservative solute using uh, a dispersivity of 30 meters. And you can see that that would project no uh, very little drop in concentration. However, this probably does not adequately account for recharge since it was a one-dimensional model. But again, there has been a tremendous drop in the volatile organic carbon concentration compared to many other species along this flow path, and this is mainly due to biodegradation. If we consider sorption using some values from the literature, KOC, recent KOC values uh, for these compounds are between 80 and 218 cubic centimeters per gram, when we measured the organic carbon concentration in the aquifer and from that calculated a partition coefficient and a retardation factor of 1.5. What this means is if the plumes that have migrated 500 meters, then uh, by retardation it should have moved only 330 meters. So even though sorption uh, may be an important process, it's not the major process that, ex that explains this attenuation of hydrocarbons. And again, along the same flow path, this is now a milligrams per liter, again, a logarithmic scale. This is at the edge, the downgrading edge of the oil body. These sampling points here are in the anaerobic zone, and it's been anaerobic ever since we've been studying it. Uh, these, these, from here on, is a mixed zone. Sometimes it's probably anoxic and sometimes it's not. So we've lumped everything else together. And you can see, you can see that there's a tremendous drop-off here within, uh, well, 100 meters from the center of the oil body. And you can see that this, that this is changing gradually with time, but it's not an even change. There was very little change from 87 to 90, and a big change from 90 to 92. So this is, this is moving in an uh, average rate of about 7 meters uh, per year. But this zone here, if you look at the mass of lots of benzene, toluene, methyl benzene, and the three xylenes, you have about the same amount of lots here as you do in the whole rest of the, uh, the, whole rest of the system. And the loss is about 1 to 10 micrograms per cubic centimeter of water per year. So we've demonstrated that there's quite a bit of loss of material in the anoxic zone as well as in the uh, mixed zone, both anoxic and aerobic zone. This, of course, is aerobic in this zone. And one reason we're quite sure that this has been anaerobic is uh, that we've been monitoring this for, for close to 10 years now, and we never detect oxygen in these wells these right here. We also have done some closely spaced sampling, which I'll show you a little bit later, which shows that there is, is uh, no oxygen and also high iron concentrations right at the water table. And again, along this plume, if you look at concentrations of iron, you again see a migration of this iron plume, which I had showed earlier, and the, the rate is about six meters per, per year, um, which is pretty close to what the hydrocarbon rate was, except this is a very even progression of iron moving down gradient. And of course, it precipitates out immediately when it encounters oxygen. And this is many orders of magnitude here on the scale here in millimoles. And if we look at methane, we see pretty much the same thing. You can see how methane concentrations uh, have, have, are beginning to drop a little bit with time, as I said earlier. And you can also see that there's a very sharp line here where it encounters oxygen. And the methane is, is apparently reoxidized. The carbon isotopes are very interesting at this site. The background concentrations of the total inorganic carbon here are between minus 11 and minus 15 per mil. And this is due to the uh, mixing of carbon from soil CO2, which we measured at minus 21.4, and that of carbonates, which are measured at minus 0.74. So the solution of the carbonates mixing with soil CO2 gives you a background mixture of minus 11 to minus 15 per mil. However, when we first started sampling at, at this site, we had values that were, were as high as minus 24 per mil. This is probably because the reactions initially were those that went to completion without fractionation of carbon isotopes, such as coupling with, with iron. And if you envision a process where the organic carbon is completely uh, mineralized to CO2, then the CO2 should reflect 
the starting material of, of the hydrocarbon. And the del C13 of the total crude is minus 28 per mil. So I think this is the reason we were having these very light volumes early on. But with increasing time, as methanogenesis has been, uh, become a more important process here, the del C13 volume, the total energy carbon, has shifted you know, to heavier volumes. And uh, the methane itself uh, is well documented that methanogenesis fractionates isotopes, and the methane incorporates the, the lighter isotope. The methane here is between minus 15 and minus 60 per mil. You can see this is the active zone of meth methanogenesis. This is where if you have mixing and returning gradually back here to ground, uh, background levels down gradient. One of the things we realized early on was that these, these processes were occurring over very small intervals. And you can see this by, this is a, a sediment that we obtained from, from a core here where the sands at the top of the core were brown sands. There's a little film of oil. And immediately beneath that, you see these gray mugs. This is very uh, similar to what you see in, in coastal marine environments, too, where you have very sharp lines between the oxic and anoxic boundaries. So we did some closely spaced sampling using the same sampling device that the people had developed, that uh, Bill Pokemrath and, and Pepe Sad and Fred Murphy had developed to look at uh, the cores for determining the amount of oil. In other words, we collected these cores froze the bottom, brought the samples to land surface, then we drilled holes in the, in the casing and collected samples of water, which we then analyzed for several constituents. And I'm showing here uh, iron concentrations in total hydrocarbons. And iron is at the bottom here, 0 to 100 uh, milligrams per liter, and the hydrocarbons, total hydrocarbons are at the top. And again, this is the summation of all the compounds, all the hydrocarbons we identified. And this is, uh, this is right at the water table. This is where we first encountered any water at all. This is only a 1.2 meter section of core. And the, the iron uh, concentration here was, was about uh, 0.8 milligrams per liter, even very close for, at the water table. So I think this demonstrates that this, this section here has been anoxic. Uh, now, there's a nice correlation between iron and hydrocarbons, and, and I'm going to try to develop uh, that theme that there is a, that there is a close association with hydrocarbons. Uh, oxidation and, and iron reduction. And you can see that the, this nice correlation, you might think that there's not enough hydrocarbon there to sustain this concentration of iron. But if you convert this all to millimoles, if you convert this, this to millimoles, it's about 0.7 millimolar concentration of iron. And for this discussion, we assume this is all benzene. And I can show you it's close to 85% 80, benzene. Then to, to produce this much iron would only take about 0.02 millimoles of hydrocarbon, but if this or a benzene, but if this were all benzene, you would have 0.08. So you have more than enough hydrocarbon present to sustain this concentration of various iron in solution. Now this particular profile was was at the very was at the uh, down breaking edge of the oil body, which is in the anoxic zone. And the next one, which is the same technique, is at the down breaking edge of the anoxic zone. And you can see again, you see this nice correlation here between hydrocarbons and ferrous iron. This led us to, uh, to, to do some microcosm experiments in the laboratory. And it had been published uh, in, by Lovely and others that there was an enzymatic link to timing oxidation and iron reduction. But this was, was done with lab, uh, under lab conditions with, with uh, bugs that were added to the system. We did some microcosm experiments to try to prove that this was actually happening at this site under the conditions at this site. And so we took uh, some sediment here, anoxic sediment, uh, which we had uh, in auger flights that we had uh, placed these liners, which had been uh, specially cleaned. And then we scooped the sediment out and put it into jars. And we added anoxic groundwater and brought this back uh, to the lab and set up microcosm experiments in 50. Uh, CC serum bottles, there was only sediment and water from the site. There were no nutrients added, there were no microbes added, there was no headspace, and the only thing that was added to these were hydrocarbons. <coughs> and the next slide shows the results of some of this work. This is a micromolar concentration now. On the and from, this shows the data from day three, which we call the starting point, and day 48, so it's a 45 day segment here. You can see in that time all the time was gone. Naphthalene increased probably due to a mixing problem in that when you have naphthalene 
and it's not so soluble in water, and we did not shake these because we didn't want to disturb the microbial attachments on the sediments. And so we, this is just, I think, not, not being really mixed well. But you can see there's a tremendous increase here in ferrous iron and, and manganese, and what little methane there was lost. Now this doesn't reflect what we see today, in that we are now seeing a lot of methane being formed, but it does reflect what I showed you earlier, that early on in the plume, iron and manganese were going into the solution first. I think the reason for this is that we had a very small amount of hydrocarbon here, and uh, there was plenty of iron and manganese coatings on these uh, sediments, so that it was not necessary, really, to for, for methane to form. Now, if we look at the control for this experiment, the experiments were set up exactly the same way, except the microcosms were autoclaved, and mercury chloride was added to poison the, the microbes. And you can see that in the same time period here, again, there was no loss of there was no extra iron or manganese formed in local loss of, of methane. Uh, I should point out too that for, for these, are, these are averages of triplicates and these are averages of duplicates for these analyses and everything here was measured in water, concentrations in the water. If we write the equations for this experiment, you can see that for each mole of toluene, you would expect 36 moles of iron to form. Likewise, for each mole of, of toluene, you might expect 18 moles of manganese to form. That is assuming that the reaction went to completion. In our experiment, then, so we should have expected something between 18 and 36 millimoles for each mole of toluene that was lost. But in our experiments, the same ratio of iron and manganese formed to toluene loss is 4.8. So there's several explanations for this. One could be that the reaction did not go to completion. However, we did look for organic acids, which are intermediates in this, this process, and we could not find any in this experiment. The other thing is that there's another process that we have not documented, and that's possible, however, we think it's unlikely. For example, sulfite and nitrate were very low at this environment. Um, concentrations of nitrate were about two to three um, micromolar, and a sulfate about 20 micromolar. So even though if they're present, they're obviously going to be reduced, they were, are not major players in this environment. So we think what's happened is the iron and manganese that's formed is associated with the sediments rather than remaining in solution. However, because these sediments contain so much iron and manganese, we could not measure the small amount that's formed from these reactions to, to verify this, that conclusion. If we carry this argument a little bit further to, to decide if there is enough iron in this part of the aquifer for this reaction to, to uh, continue, in other words, the coupling of oxidation of hydrocarbons with iron reduction. If you take the area or the volume of the aquifer that is uh, anoxic, it's about 210 cubic meters. Now, the concentration of ferrous iron in that part of the aquifer was 0.7 to 1.1 millimolar in concentration, which means then that the total iron in solution, uh, collecting for rice, there was 3.7 times 10 to the 3 grams. And the amount of iron that was found in the sediment was measured by Bennett as 1.5%, which means in the same volume of aquifer, we would find 5.1 times 10 to the 6 grams. However, work at Lovely and others has showed that perhaps not all of the iron that you measure is, is reducible. And using a tech, one of their techniques here, you can measure the amount of iron as 3.3 times 10 to the 5 grams. So the amount of iron that's reducible is probably in between these ranges here, so you can see there's still a substantial amount of iron available in the anoxic part of the aquifer for this reaction to, to go forward, so I don't think the amount of iron is going to be limiting in this particular system. Now I wanted to compare some of the results from this site to another site. The, the results I have just uh, showed you, the plume is extremely well behaved and uh, the geochemical environment was fairly easy to uh, to examine, and the plume did not change much with time, but that, as you all know, this is not uh, the same. Uh, every plume has its own character and it behaves differently. So this, this is the Galloway site in the Atlantic Coastal Plain, and this was a, uh, a tank here, about a 500 gallon gasoline tank on a private farm that was buried. And this site is like the other one in many cases, and unlike the other one in many cases, which I will point out. Here's the field site uh, with, a, with a drill rig here. 